I'm Christian. Um, I work currently for VDAB, which is a government institution in Flanders, which is in Belgium. Uh, VDAB uh, is basically doing uh, of providing job search and it's matching job seekers profiles to vacancies, etc. Basically, we are trying to get uh, get people a job. Yeah? Um, we have uh, 10 development teams of plus minus uh, 10 developers each in our software factory. And my role is a lead technical architect since uh, mid 2018. Uh, this is my fifth or even my sixth uh, project with uh, Axon Framework. And we are first time users of Axon Server uh, since April 2019. That's when we started with Axon Server. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to tell you a real life story of a more, let's say, advanced case, if I may say so. Um, uh, I'll explain uh, our situation at start. I think it's comparable to uh, many other companies. Uh, I'll explain uh, why and how we introduced Axon technology. Uh, we, I'll talk about some hurdles we encountered. Uh, I, I, I'll talk about stuff that we still feel need solving uh, at our end, but maybe also a little bit at uh, Axon's end uh, or Axonic IQ's end. And I'll share some uh, tips and advice uh, with you. We've got a lot of fragmented data uh, in multiple applications and uh, hence we also have uh, many complex integrations. Um, let me show you this. This is a, every, every little node is an application and an arrow is uh, uh, an integration. This is not everything. Uh, this comes from our pack broker. I will explain the pack broker later on. Uh, but this shows a little bit what we're dealing with here. Um, so let me scroll back. So how did we get into this, you know? And I think many companies are in, in, in this kind of situation where they got a lot of applications that are integrating with each other uh, uh, point to point. Um, uh, although there is, might be a broker in between, but still the integration is quite point to point. Well, we got there because uh, we have this principle at VDAB, which is uh, uh, flow to the work, you know? Um, so there's a project vision and, uh, excuse me, there's a project vision and there's not a product vision, meaning that um, uh, business has some ideas. We wrap them, uh, the user stories around them, we wrap them in something which is called a product. And then we cut the project into uh, a couple of slices which are handed out as scope to uh, development teams, which each have an architect, uh, uh, and, and, and the teams uh, can then parallelize the work, you know. Um, but in reality, a slice, which is with, with a slice that is taken out of this work is not really mapping well on a domain-driven design uh, domain or a business capability uh, that, a, that a clean microserver architecture would need. Uh, uh, microserver architecture means that every microservice has high inner cohesion and weak coupling with the outside. That's, that's the ideal situation. And that's not the situation that we're, we are in or with, that we were in. Huh? So then you have the famous Conway's law uh, that says that, basically says that uh, uh, if you translate it into our, our situation that a team will produce uh, and release a code base because that's their deliverable. They need to be able to release, they need to be able to, to show their work and, and, and release it, you know, and do release management on it. So they make a code base and then a code base uh, is mapped on one executable. 
uh, a war file in a Tomcat or something. And of course, uh, uh, a, a database. So every application has its own database. And then you got, you know, uh, data is scattered, uh, data pertaining to the same entity, uh, uh, the same person in reality, for example, uh, uh, is scattered and, and, and copied across uh, many uh, quite disparate applications that need each other to work. You know? And that's when you end up in a situation like, uh, like this, you know, where everybody needs everybody to work. This is not what you want. This is what you get. You know? um, so you get multiple authoritative sources for the same data. Uh, many many uh, applications are updating or creating basically the same data, you know. Um, and that leads to excessive uh, syncing. It leads to chattiness and all kinds of consistency uh, uh, problems. Uh, the links you see here, they're all on over HTTP or uh, a classic uh, message broker, uh, AMQ, and now also uh, Axon server. You can't see in the link which technology is used. This is more like a, a, a logical uh, depiction of the reality. So you end up with this very rigid integration maze. Eh? Uh, like I said, a classic JMS message broker, AMQ was used uh, in many of the integrations. Uh, so you, you, you have a lot of queue set up uh, uh, configuration and interaction with ops because we are not a DevOps company. So every time we need to set up a queue, we need to contact ops, uh, which is tedious. Uh, you get a lot of boilerplate code to interact uh, with the broker. So uh, developers really are writing JMS code. You know, they're connecting to AMQ and writing specific code to connect to to, to the middleware. An important one that hit us many times is AMQ and most of the queuing systems out there, they can preserve the order in the queue. Um, so when you cannot process a, a, a message in the queue, you will put it on a, on a, 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 well, you will retry a couple of times and then you put it on a, on a, on a dead letter queue and then you continue. Uh, but you cannot preserve uh, order per bucket. And with a bucket, I mean, imagine the queue has messages for many job seekers and uh, you can process out of order, but not within, uh, not the messages for the same job seeker. So in fact, there's, there's the, the, the queue is logically uh, divided into multiple little queues and within such a little queue, you need to preserve the right order. Well, this is not something you can do with AMQ or any other broker out there, but it is something that you can do with, uh, with Axon Server because that bucket is basically an aggregate. You know? So uh, because it's so rigid, there's also no easy splitting or merging of microservices. And we, when would you like to split? For example, if you want to scale out a part to, to, uh, uh, to a separate code base or to a separate uh, deployable uh, for scaling reasons, but maybe also because you want to give that piece to another team, to another team. It's like, it might be, uh, it might be an element of the evolution of your microservices and your domains, you know, you have your uh, your insight about your domain will grow, and then you will maybe want to split off parts, or you will realize that you, that two conformist, to put it in DDD terms, two conformist domains are basically one and the same, and you put them in the same code base or whatever, you know, you can't do this easily. So the decisions you take in the beginning typically end up to be the decisions uh, uh, that are still there or, the re or they will have shaped the reality that is still there uh, in the end. And, and this is something that 
uh, Axon technology and Axon server uh, alleviates yeah, quite a lot you know, with, the with, the, with the concept of lo location transparency. So the solution for us was Axon server. Right? Like I said, location transparency, it doesn't matter where your code is running, if it's uh, running in the same deployable or somewhere else. Uh, it's completely transparent to the, to the developer and to the code. And there's this transparent active load balancing, meaning that uh, uh, it doesn't matter if you deploy an application or a service once or a hundred times, it will continue to work. You don't have to deal with that uh, explicitly. Uh, you just deploy it yet another time and it will, uh, uh, it will it's reconfigure itself to, 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 uh, to balance load uh, across the aggregates uh, in uh, multiple deployables and multiple executables. So like I said, there's no integration code need, needed. One code base or 10 code bases, the code itself doesn't change. Um, and you can split or merge bounded contexts uh, at your leisure. Huh? Um, so another problem that this maze led us to is that our situation became quite imperforming, brittle, and also opaque from an observability uh, point of view. So uh, what you guys need to know that we still have an old school monolithic deployment model, you know, in, uh, uh, from the time that an application was like uh, a, a monolithic thing, you know, hitting the database behind two load balancers and uh, uh, deployed uh, with, with two Tomcats, uh, running the same application uh, behind that load balancer. This is a classical situation. And this is what is like kind of enforced or uh, uh, by our operations department. It's HTTP everywhere, both for reading and writing. So we literally have had, still have, services that like you, 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 you the, the user hits the or sends a request to the to the back end for front end to the first tomcat you know and and uh, then he he sends an http put or post to uh, a depending application and to another depending application to another depending application so you can imagine that this there is no transactional consistency because one of the updates might fail and then you get into an inconsistent state so there is no http has no asset protocol on top of it you know there is no guaranteed delivery there is no rollback you all know that but given the situation with the low balancers and, and the monolithic thinking about, around it uh, applications were also calling each other or, or still calling each other over the, 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 those same load balancers. Um, there's no service registry. There's no microservice gateway like Zool or Spring Cloud Gateway or whatever. Uh, there's no containers. There's no distributed tracing, etc. There's no rate limiting. Uh, so uh, when one of the Tomcats down in the dependency chain can't follow, uh, uh, you, you have a problem. Eh? And sometimes we see that one uh, request uh, from uh, an end user translates two levels further into 100 or 1,000 requests. So uh, this, this, this is and this was a big problem. Um, also, at the query side, you know, if you want to join data across microservices, uh, uh, there's no other way of doing it than joining in the memory of the caller and not of the callee. So uh, this means that you're, you're launching maybe hundreds, thousands of HTTP requests 
and, and, and you're joining the result of those requests in the memory of the caller, uh, which makes it very slow, uh, very network intensive, etc. So, of course, we, ha we, we have and had a lot of scaling issues and also a lot of observability problems because, you know, we, we can't, we, there's no distributed tracing. We can't follow uh, uh, or couldn't follow a request. Uh, yeah, so what if you want to query, you know, across all these databases, these little tiny databases, what, what happens then? You can't, or you can't efficiently. So what was the solution for this performance and brittleness uh, uh, problems? Well, it's basically CQRS, uh, uh, where uh, the same or a separate microservice is subscribed to the events of the others. Right? And it makes its own kind of flat projections of the event data, in our case, in, uh, in Elasticsearch indexes. Can also be, can also be a database, you know, or a relational database. Uh, so you can do multi-bounded context queries, and you can do stuff like complex composite screens. I will talk about that later with, uh, with what I mean with that. Um, and, and uh, everybody makes his own projections or indexes, meaning like every mi microservice, every team can decide to make the projections that team likes or that which are preferred for that particular microservice uh, 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 to work. As a bonus, which was good for us, uh, um, uh, it, it also took away the need for Oracle, for our relational database system, uh, because everything is, all data is basically stored in either Axon server or in those uh, indexes. Uh, uh, we use uh, Elasticsearch as a NoSQL database. Uh, maybe you could say we abuse it a little bit as a, as a NoSQL uh, database. Uh, uh, but that's because uh, we didn't have another NoSQL in place. But it works fine uh, for our use case, uh, our use cases. Uh, um, so that's okay. Uh, maybe a small hint for uh, Axonic. Uh, we already suggested to move the token store. Uh, uh, or at least provide a token store implementation that is provided by Axon Server itself, because then we don't need Oracle anymore uh, for, for our token store, you know. Um, and then we can just dig it, you know, uh, in many cases. I ditch it, I mean. <laughs> um, and we also saw that Oracle doesn't really like the token store. We, we see a lot of contention on the token store. It deals with it, but it takes quite a lot of resources on Oracle to always increase that number and lock it, locking problems. PostgreSQL, PostgreSQL uh, deals much better with this than, than uh, Oracle, for example. So if we can get it out, we, we, we will. And then we can get a rip of a lot of license costs as well. What do I mean with, uh, with complex queries? Uh, yeah, and the separate microservice. Yeah, well, this is basically the graphical depiction of what I already said. Uh, a, a user sends uh, an AJAX, I won't call it REST, <laughs> I call it AJAX, sends it over HTTP, basically sends uh, a, a, a command to the backend for front ends. And the backend for front end will distribute uh, uh, this uh, via uh, as a number of commands on, on various uh, uh, microservices. I will deal with this course command thing later on in the presentation. Uh, 
um, normally, usually, you, you only send a, a command to one aggregate, and that's true, but there are other, con there are other situations that I will explain later. Huh? So, uh, so several commands are sent to several microservices uh, at the same time or not, you know. Um, and uh, they, end, they all end up as events that are stored in Axon Server Event Store. And when this happens, uh, the events are also dispatched to this separate, you see it in yellow, separate uh, microservice that basically uh, uh, fills or updates our Elasticsearch. And as I also will explain later, when this has happened, uh, in some cases, not all, in some cases, we will uh, push uh, a message over a WebSocket. We use Atmosphere. Uh, we will push a message over a WebSocket to the browser of the end user, uh, stating that a query model that, he, that the, the browser, the, the end user is interested in has been updated, you know. Uh, and the end user can query, uh, can query the query model, and I see the arrow is wrong. It should go from here to Elasticsearch immediately. The, the end user can query, uh, oh, no, 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 it's true. It's, <laughs> I'm, perfectly uh, right, you know. So the, 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 the end user can send uh, uh, a request that will post a Axon query message on the microservice, and the query message will be handled asynchronously via the query message mechanisms that are there in, 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 uh, in Axon, and it will basically do a query in Elasticsearch, and then results will go back to the end user. This is CQRS, of course. So I put this orange banner on top of that, this, to resist an old reflex. You know? uh, uh, the reflex is that data should be st only stored once. Uh, this is the, the classical relational database thinking where, uh, where you, don't, you, you avoid you know, uh, uh, creating tables with uh, the same data, basically. Uh, but in the Elasticsearch or CQRS world, uh, uh, there's little synergy in keeping this data redundancy as low as possible. And that's why I said that each team can decide to create its own indexes, even if they contain the same data or more or less the same data as another index that is already out there created by another team, you know. It doesn't matter, you know. Every, every team, well, it does matter, but every team uh, uh, creates its own world and, and controls the indexes in the data that it is depending on, you know, um, unless there is a good reason not to do so. Huh? But there's a, there's there's a little synergy in keeping uh, 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 data redundancy as low as possible. So no one index to rule them all. No enterprise model. So like, which is the model for my job seeker? You know? I should only have one query model for job seeker. No. You can have multiple query models uh, 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 giving data or returning data uh, 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 for, for job seekers. You don't need GraphQL to assemble all, all those uh, models that are out there into uh, an, aggre uh, yeah, an aggregation of those models. It's not needed, you know. You just make your own projection of the data based on, on, on events that you receive from the, from the various bounded contexts. This is very flexible. I already talked about those complex screens uh, a, a few slides before. 
with a complex screen, I mean that uh, you often have these quite extensive uh, composite pages showing data of many entities out there, of many aggregates. And typically, uh, or what I saw often is that on UI level, you, 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 with REST or whatever, you get the first entity in the, in the, in the, in the, in the dependency chain. Uh, then uh, uh, you, you get all, all entities uh, attached to it, another query, another query. You have, a lot, you have a lot of entities and on the callbacks of every call uh, of when a future is resolved, you get the rest of the data. Right? Uh, this leads to many uh, disparate uh, queries on the database and, and many back and forth calling. You know? And, and, and which, is, which can be very slow and, and you, you can get callback hell in your code, et cetera, et cetera. And you can solve all of this very easily, you know? Um, you, 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 you just make a query model, a projection uh, 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 of the data you need in screen X up front in the back end, you know? Uh, with an event handler, you fill, uh, you fill that table or index with the JSON. Uh, data needed by the by the page, and then you only need one HTTP GET to retrieve the single row in the table or uh, or the single row in your index uh, containing or the document in Elasticsearch terminology. So you only need one HTTP GET to retrieve the document uh, that contains the whole screen's content. Often this is also referred to as a REST projection. Huh? This system is like fast, only one HTTP get, the data is already there. It's generic. If you want to implement this with a relational database, you, you can have like one service, a simple service that gets for an ID, a string out of the database. Like you give it an ID and it gives you a JSON string. It's very generic implementation. And it's easy to test. You know, why? Because you can shift a lot of the UI testing efforts to the back end. You can completely test on the back end if, uh, uh, when some events, you know, uh, happen, uh, uh, the projection of the data, the query model is filled in correctly. Um, in the past, this has proven to be very useful because uh, if you would really test this old school uh, with classic Selenium, uh, uh, then in the past, you often had uh, tests that tended to be brittle. You spent more time in fixing the tests than in the code itself. Well, whenever, whenever a widget is, is like moving or whatever, you know, or whenever you move some functionality, uh, you, you are fixing tests. Well, and here you just play some events uh, and you verify if, uh, that the correct JSON string is compiled in your index. Um, and something that I already touched before, uh, often, uh, and most of the time when we're dealing with wizards, you know, like you do something in, st in, in, in step one of the wizard, then you go to step two. Huh? Um, uh, often uh, in wizard style screens, uh, we, can, we make use of, of uh, push messages, WebSocket push messages, to notify that the asynchronous transaction has become eventually consistent. When such a transaction uh, becomes consistent, it typically ends with updating a query model, uh, updating an index in Elasticsearch. And when that model is updated you know, uh, correctly, uh, we push uh, a message uh, or when an observed row, because this is also something you can do with Axon, when an observed row uh, in your index is, uh, is being changed and you're displaying this row somewhere yeah, in your application, you also receive a WebSocket push message, Stomp protocol or whatever. You know. we, we, we implemented it with Atmosphere, uh, but you can choose whatever implementation you need. Atmosphere worked work fine for us. So when you receive the push, you basically enable the next button in your wizard. Uh,
going back to the observability issues, how did we solve those? Well, we, we plugged in uh, Prometheus uh, metrics kind of everywhere. We're still in the process of doing that. Uh, well, Axon Server has its own built-in metrics, which are kind of useful about number of events processed. They even go to the, to the individual command or event level, like the event type level, uh, if you need it to be. Only make sure that what you're scraping doesn't become too big. And that is also true for, uh, for the metrics you expose in your own applications. Once it gets, once the page, once the page that, that contains all the metrics and which is rendered by your application, once it gets too big, uh, this can actually slow down uh, 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 scraping and the application itself. So, for example, we implemented a, what we call a lag metric uh, for uh, the processor reading the event store and, and, and processing the events. So if your event handlers start lagging uh, behind where the, the, the event store is, the, the, that's an indication that, that you're basically too slow in processing the events. You know? Lag should, should remain under a certain boundary. Uh, or when the lag is like okay and suddenly it starts like spiking and the spike continues so then often uh, this means that there's something is congested congested further down the road uh, another metric is the time between the incoming command and the outgoing push message message so the, the request coming in uh, the request from the user entering the backend for front end and then the push message push message uh, going back to the to the user when the transaction is finished if the time between those two uh, events uh, is, is is increasing too much it means that, that 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 there's a problem and basically the time between the incoming request and the outgoing push message is is indicative of the performance of your application. Uh, it's important thing to know because those uh, um, APM tools like Dynatrace that give you metrics out of the box, they only measure the request, the synchronous request, but they don't necessarily uh, uh, measure the, the time the real transaction took. So the time between the, the request and the message, that is something that they don't measure. And that is basically what the user uh, perceives. Huh? So, the, um, so beware. Um, so Axon has its own tracing extension, uh, which supports the open tracing standard, which, visual, which will visualize, if you want it, from HT incoming command till till outgoing push message, everything in between, it will be traced and also visualized in your uh, APM tool of choice, like Zipkin. We use uh, Elastic APM now. We started with Zipkin. We use Elastic APM now, and soon we will be using uh, Jaeger uh, once we move to Kubernetes. So we already did the switch from Zipkin to Elastic APM. Went quite fine. Uh, and so we expect that when we switch to Jaeger, it will also uh, be fine. It, it, the, the, the open tracing standard itself standardizes quite a lot. You know? uh, we must admit that this uh, Axon tracing extension library uh, uh, still had a bit of a beta flavor to us. Uh, we didn't like it. Well, we liked it, but it was not doing everything like we wanted it to do it. Uh, for example, event handlers were not uh, stored in the metadata, so we, were, we knew that an event was being handled, but we didn't uh, know the, the, the name, the class name of the, of the event handler, and, and all those kind of details. So, so we, basically, we basically took the code and we extended it. Okay, uh, now for something completely different, uh, case management. Why do I say this? Because most of the applications that I used Axon for and still are using it for now are 
uh, in fact, some kind of case management. Uh, uh, as I already said, we're in a government. A government, as you know, uh, deals with a lot of rules and, and, and procedures. Uh, and these procedures and rules uh, tend to change quite frequently. And we're often dealing with uh, uh, really complex stuff, with many exceptions, deadlines, uh, uh, etc. And and the business itself is is quite event driven itself and unpredictable. Huh? So it doesn't follow a nice predictable uh, uh, workflow. Uh, a, a job seeker can, for example, find work at any moment. Huh? So the process that you're that he's in might stop at any moment uh, because he found work. Uh, but he can also get ill, for example, uh, uh, which changes the whole game. Uh, when somebody gets ill, he has, a, he has proof from the doctor, it changes the whole game. The whole game. Uh, uh, I hope not, but a job seeker can uh, decease. You can think about all kinds of stuff that will lead to events that trigger all kinds of exceptions. Huh? Um, so we used Axon framework uh, for this kind of case management. And how did we do it? Well, the business analysts, they, they stuck to their BPMN uh, uh, diagrams. And then we took those diagrams and we mapped them on, uh, on, on, on finite uh, state machines. So to give you an idea, and this is just one, uh, this is like one of those BPNs. You, know? you see it's, it's, it's complex stuff. You know? uh, and, and, and then we turn this into a finite state machine yeah? or finite state machines, where you basically, well, I think you all know uh, a, a state machine where you traverse, where you transition from one state to the other. You know? Uh, and even that was also still uh, quite complex. So how did we implement uh, uh, these state machines? And I'm already doing that since I first started using Axon uh, in 2013. This is the way I, 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 I do it now and how, I, how we did it then. And this works. Yeah? Uh, so I wanted to share this with you uh, when you start doing this, uh, how you could do it. Huh? Uh, so basically, uh, a case is, is, is a, or at least the business logic uh, for a case, uh, uh, is a saga. A saga is a process. Uh, uh, the process maps on one uh, finite state machine. And, and the finite state machine basically manages a single status field. Huh? Um, so the saga is the case manager. Huh? Uh, the saga manipulates case data, huh? the status field itself, uh, uh, some other data, the peer aggregate, further down the slide, yeah? the peer aggregate, that it is uh, storing its state into, uh, et cetera. A saga itself in Axon is stateful. It can memorize uh, uh, data. Right? And in our case, our saga memorizes some in-flight data that is only needed during the life cycle of the saga. All other data we store in the process aggregate further on the slide and a saga associates itself with in time in the beginning only one but in time the saga associates itself with all aggregate instances that play a role in the case for example the job seeker uh, uh, the, the, the meetings he went to uh, uh, the 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 vacaturus, uh, the vacancies, the vacancies that he he has applied to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. His case, yeah. 
And the saga, uh, from a code level perspective, perspective, implements the transition rules that that take uh, the case from one state status or state uh, to the other status. I must say, from one status to the other. So. Whenever an event for the particular jo job seeker or one of its associated aggregates, whenever an event is received, uh, the saga maps, the saga looks at the event, looks at the current status, at the current state, uh, and it maps it on a new status and some new state, optionally. Sometimes, and I refer to finite state machine uh, theory. A state transition itself uh, means that a command needs to be sent into the domain. So the interaction of a state is often a command. Or the fact that you left a state means that a command should be sent. A command to a domain might be send a letter. Huh? So you basically create a letter or email aggregate, uh, and, and, and when that is created, this thing sends an event, and, and, and uh, a listener, a handler, listens to that event, and it actually sends the email, or it prints the letter. Huh? That's how, how we do it. Uh, I already referred to it a couple of times. Uh, uh, you have the process itself, which is the saga, but then you have the historical uh, manifestation that such a process uh, uh, was, is uh, uh, running. And for this uh, concept, we use an aggregate. So uh, the, the process aggregate, which is basically the case, while the saga is the case manager, uh, the process aggregate contains uh, data that you want to keep or show during the process, but also after. So when, imagine the saga is finished, the process is finished, you still need some data, some reference in the system that the saga has run and, and some key attributes, some key attributes of, that, of, 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 of the process. For example, when it started, when it stopped, for whom it was, like for job seeker X, uh, uh, various data that 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 you will you like to see also afterwards and you can project uh, the data of this aggregate in 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 a in a query model of course that you'll display on a screen and during the course of its action uh, uh, the saga sends commands to the process aggregate uh, and 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 like i said also the rest of the domain Now, this state machine logic, uh, uh, how do you translate, translate state machine logic uh, onto, into an event-driven world? Yeah? Not every state machine you see out there, if you Google for finite state machine, you will see state machines for ATMs and all kinds of stuff. But not every state machine is a good state machine for uh, uh, for uh, an event-driven world. Uh, what, I, what, we, what I saw is that um, states are easily confused with events when they are uh, expressed in the past tense. Processed, right? for example. The state, the status processed. Right? Uh, it often, uh, people think that this is a status while it is an event. Um, and I will show that in the next slides. Uh, what we do is uh, we, we found that uh, a, fit, a finite state machine should be wishful. Uh, every state should express uh, the desire for the next most optimistical event. The, the best event that, that the, 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 the event that you would see in a happy path scenario, the, the, the event that would be the best, for example, for the job seeker in our case. Yeah. Uh, 
So if, if, if a status, if you're in a status and there are three exit paths, the, the, the name of the status will represent the, the, the event that, uh, uh, or the, the wish for the event uh, that, uh, that leads you into the best of the three paths. Let me explain that to you. Uh, this was how we did it, how or how analysts uh, did it in the beginning. So, uh, the, the, in the UI, somebody sent a command ex expressing the status that he wants next. You know? uh, and then the status was what you see here in red, uh, it was basically the event. And sometimes they would implement guards. So when somebody says, I want to go to this next status, the system would check if that is even possible. Uh, so it would check some business rules. And then, so it would, the user would, for example, uh, choose option three, and then the system would reply, ah, oh, sorry, you can't go for three. Yeah. While it first showed three, option three, as one of the options that the user uh, uh, could go to. Another problem is that uh, uh, this means that the end user knows the process uh, because it's him or her that actually says, I want to go to status A, B, or C. While the person should only register what happened or do something eh, with the application, and then it's the system and not the end user that decides where, where that leads us in the process, to what status it leads us. Eh? This is better. And you see the state diagram also becomes leaner. It becomes lighter. Uh, uh, the, 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 the command uh, is an actual command and not uh, uh, an instruction to change a status. It's a command. And it leads to a status. Yeah? And the status always starts with awaiting. It expresses a desire uh, for the best next event, uh, for the best next status. Uh. So uh, when the person is uh, awaiting or the, the process is awaiting uh, the, the, the planning of the meeting, uh, the most, that's the most optimal state. When somebody needs to find a job, you know, uh, a meeting to get planned uh, to talk about uh, uh, this job offer is, is the most desirable status. So when somebody is awaiting a planning uh, and uh, the, the, the event meeting with job seeker planned arrives, it takes us to the awaiting meeting repo. Huh? And when uh, uh, the report has been written, so the meeting took place, and the report about the meeting has been written, that will send the meeting uh, report finalized uh, event. So what you see in bold is events. What you see in the ellipsis are statuses. And they typically start with the word awaiting. I'm awaiting for the most optimistical event to happen. And then you will also see that you actually arrive into the final state. Well, in this approach, you never do. OK. Uh, Let's take you to the next big block uh, 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 of concerns we, we, we had. And that's, OK, we're working here with 10 teams in parallel 
on 40 plus services. Many depending services are developed at the same time simultaneously. So A depends on B, B depends on C, and they're all being developed at the same time. So B cannot, so A cannot wait until B is finished before it starts developing its own uh, logic. So they're all evolving at the same time, a lot of moving parts. Huh? Um, and that means that as it goes, the structure of the commands and events, their payload uh, frequently changes. And how do you deal with that when, when you have so many disparate things working next to each other? Well, first of all, you try not to break yourself. Um, some general rules apply. Uh, avoid upcasting. If you start doing, uh, upcasting should be used as a last measure. If you start applying upcasting logic from the very beginning on, it's not a, a good sign. Um, in general, we, we, we apply Postal's law. Huh? So we're conservative in what we send, but if we receive something that is not completely up to our liking or is not what we ex uh, expected, at least, we, we, we still try to resolve it into something uh, which is uh, acceptable by us. You know? So if suddenly there are five uh, uh, variables or five member variables in, 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 in the event that we receive and we only expect a tree, we basically don't care. No? And we never use the full qualified class name for our event ties because classes, uh, the package of classes often changes due to refactorings and then the whole class name or the package name is quite annoying. Eh? It's a simple thing, but you have to think about it. Uh, and then we have three strategies uh, in order not to break the other services. Uh, we try not to break other services. So when we, before we release a new version of our application, uh, we try to be sure that we don't break somebody else with it, yeah? another service. So the first uh, uh, way we do this is, and I will discuss all three, uh, is we, we, we apply domain-driven di design principles. You know, we really stick to domain-driven design principles, context, context maps, et cetera, et cetera, domain isolation, these kind of things. Uh, Another thing we do is we uh, we use PACT. You know, we 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 do consumer contract testing. Talk about that later also. And the third thing is uh, we adapted adapted. Uh, we we use Open API and Swagger Swagger Hub, uh, but instead of the traditional uh, request response, uh, we also use it for events. And I'll explain later on how we did that. So domain isolation. Uh, so domain-driven design says uh, you need to isolate bounded contexts with, an, uh, with a layered architecture uh, to protect contexts from each other. Okay? So when one evolves, the other one is not broken. And when the, the other one evolves, the first one is not broken. Uh, and in domain-driven design, uh, uh, this is typically done uh, with the concept of a published language versus the domain language you use internally in your bounded context. For now, and it might change later, but for now, we use a single shared Axon server context for the exchange of public events. So our published language goes into a separate Axon server context. The domain language of microservice A goes into 
context A. But all microservices will write their published language into the shared integration context. So the shared integration context is basically the sum of the published languages of the various individual microservices. <clears throat> and the events that go into the integration context, we have namespaced them. So the event type is, uh, is a combination of the emitting, the publishing uh, uh, source application, and then a slash, and then the event name. For example, MLB, which is an application, MLB slash uh, job seeker registered, something like that. And then we are slowly evolving to the concept of interchange contexts. This is an evolution of domain driven design by Eric Evans himself. There's a video somewhere on YouTube. I can share the link with you guys afterwards uh, that, that talks about uh, uh, a set of microservices uh, that at a certain point decide that when they talk about something, for example, again, a job seeker or uh, a vacancy or something else, when they talk about something among each other, they use the same definition, the same language. Uh, uh, it's not an enterprise model because in an enterprise model or the canonical model, in the enterprise model that DDD uh, is opposing uh, fiercely, uh, in the enterprise model, the whole company would have to be agreeing on the definition of a job seeker, you know, what goes in there, what doesn't, doesn't go in there, you know. Uh, and and which, which, is, which sounds like a good idea, huh? but which has proven again and again to be a very bad idea, you know. So uh, the interchange context is more like this thing, you know, those three microservices, they decide that they, when they talk about the job seeker or whatever, it, it, it's the same thing, you know, the same fields and the same meaning. I already talked uh, about uh, a hexagonal model. So I really, well, my tip to you is that if you start thinking about microservices, whether you made them with Axon or not, you have to mentally apply this model. You know, it's the Alistair Cockburn model. Uh, you also have onion architectures and all that, but this, I, we use the hexagonal model. It's called the hexagon model because you see a, a hexagon here, but it, it, it doesn't have to be a hexagon, of course, it's just a way of wording it. Uh, it's also referred to as ports and adapters. And it basically means that you have a core application in which there is a domain uh, and the core application which surrounds the domain uh, uh, has an, a, not one, you know, not one set of three layers, but as a, a multiple layers around it. Uh, uh, and each port is like a functional thing and it's abstract so you have the the port for um, for the ui for example you know a ui port and it's abstract uh, and on top of that port you put an adapter so in our case uh writing to the integration context or interchange context or reading from it uh, is done via uh, a separate adapter and a separate port, the integration port or the interchange port. Um, and physically, or uh, this adapter is, 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 is a module, uh, a domain-driven design module, more or less. Uh, um, and well, it's, it's a separate jar 
or a separate deployable. We start with a jar, evolutive microservice architecture. We, we, we just start with a separate library and that library only knows or sees uh, the commands and events of the inner application of the inner domain. So it's really loosely coupled. It listens to or is subscribed to the, the domain events uh, coming out of the application and it acts upon them. Yeah? And sometimes when a job seeker is registered in the domain, it also means that a job register uh, uh, integration event should be put on the integration context, for example. Uh, but although both events look the same, and maybe if you look at their payload, are the same, these are separate class trees, you know, uh, so that one can evolve separately from the other. And the integration context is in fact a contract. We put uh, consumer contracts, like we will see further on the integration context. We, 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 we honor our contracts. The domain can change. Eh? Uh, the events in the domain can change uh, without hindering uh, external parties. So this is basically conceptually what you see. A user uh, uh, fires a request, which is basically a command that changes an aggregate person, uh, uh, which will yield a domain event, uh, of course. And then one of these adapters, in this case, the integration uh, adapter, will transform that domain event in and mirror it into an integration event which is stored in its own Axon server context. And another microservice that basically deals with job seekers, uh, which are the, in reality the same persons than the person, the same data, the same real world object uh, than the person that you're seeing in the left microservice. But the job seeker is conceptually different, you know. And this is domain-driven design at its best. The job seeker has the same data as the person. It is in reality the same thing, but conceptually how you look at it from the domain of the job seeker, the right microservice is completely different. So uh, an integration event uh, is, is, is like captured by this uh, adapter uh, on, on the right microservice and is mapped onto its own domain on its own aggregate with a command. So this is how person and job seeker will uh, uh, in a way mirror each other, but still have their own life cycle, their own concepts, their own business processes. They only share the same data, but it first happens in the left microservice when the person is, for example, registered, it first happens there, and then it will lead over a command to a peer concept in the right microservice, and there the job seeker will be registered. So it's only done from the perspective of the right microservice. A job seeker only exists when the job seeker registered event has fired, and not when uh, the person register event has fired. And this is really key to understanding how you should make microservices and different domains cooperate on the same data. Uh, this, is, this is the click, you know, you, 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 I saw you need to make, to, to let them understand each other and share data without bothering each other. And, and having, uh, different processes, different business logic on the same data. Okay, something else. I also talked about course uh, mutations. Well, course commands, course mutations. Uh, look, in general, you know, this is what, in general, uh, uh, we favor, uh, like it should be, a task driven task-driven UI or user experience, meaning that 
uh, a user clicks a button or, or selects a menu item or, do, or, or does something which is kind of fine grained and only triggers a, a fine grained mutation of the domain. So it's just one intention, one step in a use case. Not a big giant save button that saves the screen, triggering maybe five different use cases in the backend, you know, where the intention is not clear because you, you filled in like 10 fields, you clicked save. What, what is it that you wanted to, to, to trigger? Did you want to change the birth date? Did you want to change the, the I'm making it simple here. Did you want to change the birthday? Did you want to uh, uh, move uh, the guy to another uh, city or something? You know, all those things come together at the same time because you click one uh, course uh, save button. So we usually refrain from doing so, uh, and we send one command to one aggregate with one UI widget uh, mapping on that. This is how it should be by definition of what an aggregate is. An aggregate is a consistency boundary. But sometimes the UX team wants it to be different. You know? They want to combine several actions in the same screen. And because it's from a perspective of the user, sometimes more logic to do so in some cases. And then what do you do? Because you can't send a command to multiple aggregates at the same time, this is against the, the principle of uh, domain driven design. You can't send a command to multiple aggregates, or it means that your aggregate is just too small. It's not, it's not well made, but often it's well made. You know, uh, the, the, the aggregate is an aggregate should be kept small. The aggregate is small like it should be, but it's just discrete. You know? Uh, now, uh, what I wanted to explain here is that this adapter, uh, this hexagonal adapter that I've been talking about, it can deal with uh, coarse multi-aggregate mutations, which sounds like heresy. But how does this work? A command creates this coarse command, eh? Eh? creates a new aggregate instance of type foo. Uh, and then the foo instance itself represents the course transaction itself, or the intention to perform it, that is. Huh? So you event source the command. Uh, and then a saga, a little saga, which still lives in logically, conceptually into that adapter, it consumes the full registered event. And then it sends the commands uh, uh, to the various aggregates in the real domain, uh, and it guarantees eventual consistency. So it sends a command to aggregate one, another command to aggregate two, another command to aggregate three, you know? And if something fails in the meantime, you're not in an inconsistent state as per definition of the aggregates, you know? Uh, but, but, but the, 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 the error handling, uh, the compensating transactions or the error handling, like flagging uh, the dossier as erroneous or in status anomaly or something like that, uh, or, or popping up something in the user's uh, face, uh, is, done by the, is done by the saga. It, it, it will get stuff eventually uh, consistent in the end. Yeah? That's why I also stress that error handling uh, often is a business process. Most of the time, error handling is a business process. We should get away from the idea that everything is asset, that the, the whole system is consistent, you know, always at, in one shot, you know, uh, because this is against splitting up systems in microservices. Uh, and per definition of the aggregate concept, which is a consistency by boundary, uh, uh, the domain cannot get in a true inconsistent state. So imagine two out of the three commands succeeded. The third command could not succeed. 
Well, basically that means that two aggregates have been made consistent, but the third has not been made consistent yet. Huh? Uh, but the, the first level of consistency, the immediate consistency has been taken care of. So there is no real inconsistent state in the domain. It's only an inconsistent state in the course of the transaction. Huh? But what is in the database, you know, what is in the Axon server uh, 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 event store makes sense. It's just not finished yet. Something we ran into, we started questioning ourselves is like, you saw this uh, integration context thing that I talked about. Um, now, whatever goes, each event that goes from microservice A to microservice B with an integration context in between is event sourced itself. So it's stored, it's made persistent forever. Yeah? Is that the good approach? Right? Is that a good idea to, to, to have like a persistent integration uh, uh, layer? Huh? Well, you should ask yourself the question. Uh, do you really need to be able to replay the integration context later on? Uh, or do you simply exchange data between microservice as non-persistent value objects so that when, whenever the, the, the message is delivered, it, it evaporates. Now there's no trace of it anymore. Um, so is it, are we talking about the traditional message broker that ships data from A to B and then forgets what it has shipped? Or do you need to memorize what you shipped? in an integration context store. Uh, well, ask yourself the question, if replayability and exactly what is being replayed or not, be the decision of each individual consumer of the event. And in the most cases, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, because when you receive like we saw here, when the job seeker uh, bounded context, the job seeker microservice uh, uh, received an integration event, uh, it's a consumer in this case. If it, if it receives such an event, it can always decide if it wants it to be event sourced or not. And what out of which data out of that event it wants to event source and how it wants to event, how it wants to call it. If it wants to call it a, a person or a job seeker, I think it will call it a job seeker, you know? So the, the consumer can always decide if it wants to, to be uh, event sourced and what, how. But, but with the current version of Axon server and the Axon framework, if you do so, you won't be able to leverage on all the goodies like location transparency, no boilerplate code, zero configuration, all the stuff that I talked about earlier on. You won't be able to do that because you will be sending it with a classic broker or something. So this is what we still feel is uh, lacking from our perspective because we want to have like an upcoming feature which is called ephemeral events because then we can use Axon server uh, in a way that it forgets about integration events that were passed, uh, that, that were transmitted uh, from A to B uh, X time ago, a week ago. So we, we only recall in the integration context what we want to recall. And, uh, but we still can use all the goodies, you know, like the location transparency, uh, all, all the good stuff, you know, we don't need to wire into uh, JBoss MQ or something like that. You know? Consumer contract testing. Uh, this is a, another strategy, uh, like I said, to, to, to do API uh, events and commands governance. Uh, we use PACT 
but there's also a spring contract. There are many others out there. We use Pact because it's the most widely known, most complete solution, according to us. So what is it, consumer contract testing? Well, you, can, you should read about it. It's, uh, I'll try to uh, keep it short here. Uh, uh, in principle, in the core of it, service consumers and service providers, they close a pact. You know, a, a consumer expresses its expectations towards the producer's API, to, what, to the, towards the producer's service as a pact. And it does so by uh, uh, writing a unit test that, that, that says, basically says, if I send you this, then uh, what, what you reply to me is structured like that. It's not a functional test. It's a, it's a, it's a formal test on, on, on the API. So you run the unit test, and, and, and in the unit test, you, 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 you test various stuff. You use, typically use some kind of DSL that, that, that you, you, you use to express your expectations towards the producer's service. And, and after the unit test has run, it creates a, a JSON string, which is a pact. And that pact expresses what A expects from B what consumer expects from producer. And this JSON string, this pact, is stored in a pact broker. Uh, it's an application running somewhere centrally, and it stores all the JSON strings, all the pacts, all the contracts, yeah? all the consumer contracts going to the broker. And when the producer, uh, in its build pipeline, Jenkins or whatever, uh, uh, wants to deploy, automatically deploy a new version of its service, it will run, it will need to pass a quality gate. In the quality gate, it will, there will be a unit test that checks if all packs retrieved from the pack broker are still being honored. And if one of those packs cannot be honored anymore, the build will break. So that's how you prevent deploying code that breaks others. Yeah? Uh, uh, the pack broker itself, you, sh you should be regarded as a, a, a pack catalog. Um, uh, in fact, it's a, it shows a set of service versions that are compatible, at least from the API perspective. S services that can talk to each other because they will they understand each other, yeah? And as a bonus, it, it gives you a graphical representation of the service mesh. You saw it uh, in, in the beginning of the, the presentation. It should be regarded as a cheap integration test because you don't need to deploy anything. You don't need to deploy A, you don't need to deploy its dependencies, B, C, and D, no. You just verify whatever A, B, and C produce is compatible from a formal API perspective. That's why it's cheap. Yeah? You don't need to run stuff. Containers, blah, blah. no, you just test it with information, uh, based on information that's, in, that's basically in your pack broker. So uh, I talked, this is just, a, what you see here is just the start of, 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 of what you see in, in a message broker on the left. Well, you, you see a list of microservices that are consuming, you see a list of microservices that are providing a service, and you uh, and the pack broker uh, 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 basically says uh, uh, which for which service is compatible with which service, and when that uh, was last verified. And then you get graphical representations as a bonus, like the one you also see here. Okay, um, the last API governments uh, pillar or strategy that we have uh, is uh, the governance itself. You know? How uh, does, how do services know what the other service is providing to us? You know? So which events 
can I subscribe to? Which integration events can I subscribe to? And we didn't really find a good tool yet. I know there is a sync API and all that, but it still didn't, uh, uh, it, we didn't find a good tool yet to do this kind of governance. Uh, so what we did is we, we, we used what we had. Uh, we used uh, Swagger Hub. And Swagger Hub is like the, uh, well, you guys probably know it, it supports uh, the open API uh, specification. And typically this is geared towards uh, request response kind of communication, uh, REST, you know. Uh, but we used it for events huh? also. We used it for Axon events. So here you see a screenshot. Uh, and at the left-hand side, you see a bunch of events. We all had to put them in the same pot that was because it's not really, like I said, Swagger Hub and Swagger is not geared towards this kind of thing. But this is the best we could get. So we have all the integration events, you know, uh, and, and we formally describe them in an API first way uh, in, in Swagger Hub. But then a lot of stuff was lacking. Uh, because when you, um, when microservice B wants to consume uh, integration event, whatever, in shutting the annex from microservice A, uh, it needs to uh, write a, a value object, a POJO, that, that, that contains those fields uh, that is interested in. So it needs to have, for reasons of Axon, it needs to have a POJO that maps on inscutting the end uh, or whatever event that you see here and that it is, that it is interested in. And the, the standard code generators for Jackson and, 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 and Swagger and the standard Maven plugins to do so, they do generate the POJO, but they don't generate the annotations that we need, like at revision, et cetera, et cetera, at ID or, or, or whatever stuff, you know? So how did we do this? How did we fix this? Uh, and I can give you more information if you send me an email afterwards, if, if it would interest you. Uh, we, we, uh, we made our own uh, Swagger plugins, you know, uh, that generate code uh, that generate code based on um, on the Open API specifications in Swagger Hub. So here you see the Maven plugin we made, and at the right hand side you see how it uh, how it can be used in in, in, Maven, in Maven, and this is a slide that gives you an idea of what this uh, extension, what this plugin can do. So it uses the open API extensions feature. So open API specification has a means to, 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 to extend itself. Uh, and so we use the metadata uh, in this case in X dash VDAB. Uh, yeah part of the documentation uh, of the document, the snippet XVDAB, uh, we say that the, the, the class should have an annotation, my class annotation with a parameter some value, and that on the level of the individual uh, uh, member variables, uh, in this case EKL, it, there should be also two annotations. And then, uh, when we apply the, the, the Maven plugin to the JSON, which is basically stored in Swagger Hub, uh, it will generate this kind of, a, of, 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 of class. There are other use cases we cover with this plugin mechanism, uh, but this is just one example of the things we do with our, with our, uh, with our code generator uh, plugin. And then last, uh, 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 the last slide 
to end it, uh, is uh, information about uh, a, a data API we are making. So uh, this is also something we realized that is that currently we are, the events that we ship in the integration context are really business events. They, they express an intention, they express, uh, express a change that happened with a job seeker or whatever, you know, uh, a, a, a distinct business event. But if you look at the event, uh, uh, it only contains the data that is needed for uh, uh, that event. It doesn't contain all the data of the job seeker. It just contains what has changed. Huh? Uh, and in the beginning, we started shipping out those business events to our data warehouse, to our analytics platform. So, so, so we made a, a, a custom uh, Axel server Kafka bridge, and it just streams every event in the integration context as it happens to Kafka and from Kafka into the analytics platform, the data lake, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But these systems, data warehouse systems, uh, uh, or analytics platforms, they are not so much interested in the individual uh, task-driven events. They're just interested in the full data. Yeah? They don't want to make, compose or assemble uh, the full data themselves. They just want at every event that happens, at every mutation, whatever the reason, whatever the intention, they just want to get the full data. So, uh, so we extended our Kafka bridge, or we're in the phase of extending it, where whenever uh, 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 some change happens to a job seeker, for example, we update uh, a query model that is destined for, that is dedicated uh, for uh, the data warehouse or the analytics platform. And we update the query model. And this is combined, of course, with an event. And that event is the one that we ship on Kafka. And it contains the new data for the complete job seeker. It doesn't contain just what changed. It contains the whole thing. So they just need to take it, put it into their uh, uh, data lake, and they have the, the latest updated data if they choose to have that. Yeah. It's extremely fast, uh, as a side note. And we are planning to make a data on demand API too. So instead of just observing uh, uh, changes, uh, we will uh, provide, we will stream data, all job seekers, for example, uh, to uh, consumers on demand. Uh, how we will do that, uh, it will definitely be a stream API, uh, it, it, but it still needs to be developed. We're looking at Eric's Java uh, reactor, that kind of stuff. I think there is another session uh, about uh, 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 in the microservice conference uh, that talks about uh, coupling uh, Axon server or Axon event streams to the monos and the fluxes of a reactor and, and, and spring. Uh, so I'm very interested in uh, looking at how they did this. And I think this wraps it up, you know. Uh, thank you for your attention.